Making its first appearance in Star Wars Episode V, The Empire Strikes Back, the planet Dagobah is a murky world of swamps and bogs, drowned in mist and teeming with a multitude of snakes, slugs, bats, and other creepy creatures. It is the homeworld of the Tash, a sapient species of reclusive worm-like beings that can reach eight meters tall. They live in a primitive but peaceful society hidden deep in the thick, impenetrable jungles well out of sight of the planet's rare visitors. The planet Dagobah is a wet terrestrial 13% larger than Earth and 27% more massive. This gives it a surface gravity similar to Earth's and a mean density of approximately 4.86 grams per cubic centimeter. While water permeates nearly the entire crust of the planet, large bodies of water such as lakes and small seas make up only 8% of the surface area. This indicates that Dagobah possesses a very low topographical range, leading to a relatively flat surface with few significant valleys or mountain ranges. This suggests that either the planet has never possessed plate tectonics nor widespread volcanic activity and has therefore never developed valleys and mountains, or, more likely, the planet is very old, its plate tectonics and surface volcanism ceased eons ago, and its valleys and mountains have long since eroded away. Dagobah orbits its parent star with a period of 341 days, or 355.83 local days, given the planet's 23-hour synodic rotation period. It is said to possess one moon, yet no information exists that describes it. Dagobah is the second planet of five orbiting the star Darlow, which is described as being a dim white star. Describing any white star as dim is quite peculiar as these stars have surface temperatures ranging between 6,000 and 7,000 Kelvin, considerably hotter than our own sun. Therefore, the dim adjective must be a metaphor describing the type of white star it is. One possibility is that Darlow is a white dwarf. These objects are not true stars, but rather stellar remnants, that which remains after an intermediate to low mass star runs out of fusible hydrogen and dies. While very hot, they are also quite small, around the size of Earth, giving them a low luminosity which makes them difficult to observe at a distance, so referring to one as dim would be reasonable. However, I don't believe that Darlow is a white dwarf. To begin with, it is unlikely that Dagobah could have survived the death of the progenitor star, but even if it did, or formed afterwards as a second generation planet, it would orbit far too distantly to be habitable, even considering the most generous parameters for the star's mass and luminosity, and assuming a thick greenhouse atmosphere for Dagobah. I consider it much more likely that the term dim marks Darlow as residing on the low temperature end of the F spectral type of main sequence stars. It could be that in the Star Wars galaxy, it is an astronomical convention to refer to stars toward the low temperature end of the spectral type as dim stars, and the stars on the high temperature end as bright stars. I am unaware of any proof of this, but I consider it a reasonable speculation. If this is the case, it would place Darlow's mass between 1.1 and 1.2 solar masses and its luminosity between 1.6 and 2.5 times that of our Sun. These parameters would give the planet Dagobah an average orbital distance between 0.99 and 1.01 .01 astronomical units, and the amount of energy it receives would range between 1.63 and 2.45 times that which Earth receives from the Sun. This high level of stellar irradiance would lead to warmer temperatures on Dagobah and would be consistent with the planet's canonical description, which states that it possesses a wet season that is warm and humid, and a dry season that is dangerously hot and arid. Seasons on Dagobah are quite different from seasons on Earth. On Earth, the seasons are caused by the tilt of Earth's rotational axis relative to its orbital plane. During one quarter of its orbit, one hemisphere is tilted toward the sun and is in summer. For another quarter of its orbit, it is tilted away from the sun and in winter, and in between these seasons are two equinox seasons, spring and autumn, where the planet's tilt is perpendicular to the sun and its temperatures are mild. Because Earth's seasons are based on its obliquity, its seasons are bihemispherical, meaning that whatever season its northern hemisphere is experiencing, the southern hemisphere is experiencing the opposite season. 
Dagobah's seasons are not caused by its obliquity, which is likely very low, but rather by its high orbital eccentricity. Rather than having a nearly circular orbit like Earth, Dagobah's orbit is presumed to be much more elliptical, resulting in the amount of energy it receives from its sun varying significantly between the points in its orbit that are closest and farthest from the star. This makes Dagobah's seasons ahemispherical, meaning that the hemisphere you're in makes no difference as the entire planet experiences the same season. It's tempting to conclude that Dagobah's dry season coincides with its periastron, its closest point to its sun, and highest level of stellar irradiance. But this may not necessarily be the case. The higher thermal energy from being closer to its star would lead to greater evaporation of the planet's surface water and stronger atmospheric circulation, which would cause intense storm activity and expand the planet's rain bands to higher latitudes. The increased cloud coverage would also raise the planet's albedo, causing more of the star's energy to be reflected into space and leaving surface temperatures milder than what one might expect. These conditions closely match the canonical description of Dagobah's wet season. Furthermore, half an orbit later, as Dagobah nears its apastron, or farthest point from the sun, it would see its lowest stellar irradiance, lessening the rate of water evaporation and cooling the atmosphere, causing its rain bands to retreat back to the tropics and desert bands to develop at the higher latitudes. The reduced cloud cover would allow more heat to reach the surface, making life perilous for the creatures dwelling there. This matches the canonical description of Dagobah's dry season. Unfortunately, not having any data for Dagobah's orbit prevents us from determining anything specific about its seasonal temperature range or hypothesizing any further about the dynamics of its climate. Additionally, practically nothing is known about Dagobah's atmosphere. From visual clues, we can estimate that it has a nitrogen-oxygen concentration similar to Earth's at a pressure conducive to human life. Given the planet's photosynthesizing biomass and its reported lack of significant volcanism, it is likely to have a low concentration of carbon dioxide compared to Earth, with its humid, greenhouse-like environments predominantly the result of atmospheric water vapor. So how realistic is the planet Dagobah from Star Wars? Dagobah's geophysical parameters are surprisingly accurate. Planets of its mass are expected to have densities similar to what Dagobah possesses. However, they are also expected to hold on to their heat for a very long time, so Dagobah's lack of significant volcanism suggests that the planet and its system are very old. Plus one point. No data exists for Dagobah's orbit beyond its period, and given the additional lack of data for its parent star, this is not enough to work with. Dagobah having only two seasons implies that it possesses a low obliquity and significant orbital eccentricity, but there is no further information to corroborate these implications. So, zero points. Although there is no specific data for Dagobah's atmosphere, the descriptions of its surface conditions, seasonal variations, and geological climate zones provides just enough information to make its climate plausible. So, plus one point. Dagobah is described as having a single moon, which is, of course, quite realistic. However, there is no information given for this moon. Therefore, zero points. The lack of any real data for Dagobah's parent star, Darlo, leaves us no choice but to speculate about its type and parameters. Although some of these speculations paint a realistic image of the Darlo system, this is almost certainly by accident rather than design. So, I'm not going to give it a point. With a total of two points, the planet Dagobah from Star Wars receives a C grade. This is an astoundingly good score for a Star Wars planet. However, it possesses the same vague descriptions, nonsensical terminology, and lack of specific data that most Star Wars planets do. It's just that, in this case, it happens to fall within a range that could potentially be realistic if we make some generous assumptions. But I'll take it. Thank you for joining me on this analysis of the planet Dagobah. From here, I'll be returning to our galaxy for a bit to explore some of the many sci-fi worlds in our own backyard. I hope to see you there. Until then, may the Force be with you.